So how do you define a good farmer? Someone outstanding in their field. <laughs> so that will be today and tomorrow, even more so. So I'd like you to join me on a tour of a futuristic look of Pacific Northwest wheat farming, dryland wheat farming in 30 years. There's five stops we're going to take on this tour. The first one is around plant breeding. The second one on how we transport grain. The third one is machinery. The fourth one is soil science. And the fifth one is skills needed on a farm. Now, I've spent the last three years trying to understand the needs of the dry land wheat farmer in the Pacific Northwest. And I've spent a lot of time surveying, observing, and speaking with those farmers. I want to share some of what I've learned with you. The first thing is, is when you ask one of those farmers a question, you need to be sure to speak in their right ear. <laughs> Why is that? Well, how do you drive a tractor? Sit in the seat, square forward, both hands on the controls? No. You sit sideways. You drive with your left hand on the controls, and you look over your right shoulder at your implement. They've been doing that for so long that they are now deaf in their left ear. How long has this been? How many farmers are deaf? Well, my survey showed that the median age is 57. That over three quarters of the farmers in the Pacific Northwest, dryland wheat farmers, are over 50 years of age. Only 19% are under 30. They're are only 6% between 30 and 50 years of age. Only 6% of the farmers are between 30 and 50 years of age. There is a lost generation. And how did this happen? A well-intended program in the 1980s paid farmers to set aside crop ground back to the natural grasses. It's called the Conservation Reserve Program, or CRP. It was well intended. It's had many, many great benefits over the last 30 years right now. Uh, reduced soil erosion, improved water quality, improved fish habitat. It represents 1.1 million acres of crop ground removed out of the state of Washington over the last 30 years. The scale and size of that, we have 2.2 million acres of wheat produced in the state of Washington. In a good price year, that's over 900 million in export sales. 95% of the wheat in the Pacific Northwest is exported to Asia. So that's a big impact uh, on the, in the area. Um, that impact uh, lost a generation. And right behind that, half the farm dealerships went out of business to the region. And followed on that were the farm supply stores, auto dealerships, fuel distributors, restaurants, hardware stores, grocery stores, and the small rural communities closed. It was a big impact. And the impact also affected the big OEMs, they quit producing specific machinery needed for the region by the mid-90s. So, th so this has been a huge impact on the area. And the last bit of information that I gleaned from these farmers, well, you had two choices. You either went big or you continued to use your machinery from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So going big, what does that mean? It meant buying or renting more land and spending money on those machines, the big productive machines. So a combine in the 1980s cost $750,000. A combine in 2017 cost as much as three quarters of a million dollars. And that replaces four of those combines from the 1980s, that one machine. So this leads to why the Pacific Northwest wheat farmer 
is going to jump into the future faster than in any, any other industry. And I'm going to take you on that journey now. So picture in your mind the beautiful golden wheat fields of our region. It's mid-July. Harvest is in full swing. It's 2050. On my farm, I sell directly to the Asian flour mills now. One of my large customers has just left the farm today to head back to Taiwan. He's been making this journey for 28 years, since 2022. And that was at a point in time when there was a baking research program that found that we had the right characteristic in our grain that gave the Asian flour, flour mills the characteristics they wanted for a premium cracker that they were baking. That happened because of work of the industrial plant breeders. They were able to tailor the seed to meet the needs of that baking characteristic at the same time, they were able to breed for our microclimate of our farm. That allowed us to, to be much like the wine industry. And we were able to trademark and certify our wheat. And we branded it the Great Columbia Plateau Wheat. Columbia, the, our brand, the Great Columbia Plateau Wheat, we were able to uh, be leaders in the farm-to-table movement at that time when we did that. And that was 30 years ago. Because remember, it's 2050. So we've been doing it for that long. We had Asian flour mills showing up weekly to our farm. Each one of them wanted to take home a piece of the Pacific Northwest. So they placed container load orders as they left. The timing couldn't have been better for a container load order. Because the 50s grain handling system was antiquated and needing of serious repair. In the past, in that system, each grain kernel was touched 10 times between the combine and the flour mill. Today, we load half-ton bags in the combine transfer 60 of them to a container in the edge of the field, and now the rest is history. We ship about 200 30-ton containers a year into Asia. Container market is cheaper and much more capacity. So that was one of the big changes that happened. At the same time, We were able to, um, a lot, you know, with the branding, the microclimate seed breeding program, the direct sales, the container load shipping, gave us a 25% price premium for our crop. Those were all huge benefits to the system. In the same time period, in the mid-2020s, the farmers were really struggling with no-till and ways to seed in the no-till. A totally unexpected thing happened. Our solution was presented. It was a small 25 horsepower, rubber tracked, riding lawn mower size tractor called a track bot. This is an example of it that we put together, that was put together in 2017. Now inside this unit, it's just off the shelf, auto industry, autonomous vehicle electronics, commercially available. It was a very simple, all equipment was right there because everybody else in the auto industry and in the trucking industry was racing off to do this stuff. So this solution, allowed the farmers to move quickly and 25% and, uh, 
24-7 operation, fully autonomous, self-refueling, self-recharging with supplies, controlled with your smartphone or tablet, became a big solution to removing the bur burden of an operator. At that point in time, implements and tractor combinations were about a million dollars. 600 horsepower tractor, $600,000, a grain drill, $350,000. The bot, a fleet of bots operating could displace that for under $200,000. An 80% reduction in cost to the farmer. Large and small farms could adopt this small machine because it was right size and had high precision, six inch row spacings it could hold. It was so disruptive in the marketplace, the farmers that adopted it quickly and early, it didn't matter what the size was of their farm, they were able to sell their equipment at traditional prices buy the bots they needed, and put money in the bank. The farmers that waited just five years, getting into about 2030, only got pennies on the dollar for their farm equipment. I remember driving through the community about that time, and every time my kids saw one of those yards full of equipment waiting to be scrapped out, they would yell, junk garden. Technology brings negative and positive. There's not always smiles all the way around. And it was a big impact. Deer and Case IH were even caught off guard. They were still monkeying around with trying to control a 40-foot implement. This right-sized machine created a huge breakthrough. Right at the same time this was happening, the wheat community began to learn how to control or how to supplement the soils with black carbon, and that just a basic natural element that we have. It built better nutrients and moisture control and soil structure. A soil agronomist and a soil scientist in that time formed a company called Black or called Carbon Brothers. And they had a breakthrough that coated the wheat seed with the black carbon to form a cocoon. That gave the wheat growers a 20% increase in yield. 10 years later, about 2033, 35 in that time period, they came out with their second disruptive technology. It was a way to seed the wheat without breaking the capillary channels. Now, the Carbon Brothers, up to that time, had been, you know, getting great effects with the black carbon. And the local research universities at that time were also preaching that you needed to break the capillary effect to preserve moisture. But the brothers went out to the CRP, idled CRP ground, and began to research out there, and found that if they did not break that, they had much better benefits. They found that when you broke the capillary effect, it was the equivalent to an avalanche on I-90 in the mountains. You cut off food, water, and other supplies to the microorganisms in the soil. So it was a totally disruptive technology that they came up with. It was a small, whirly gig, biodegradable. You used it one time. They would fly them off and it would seed itself into the ground. Now, wheat, dry land wheat farming, you need at least a half a million seeds per acre. So they had a machine developed that would launch 100,000 of these machines a, a minute, these gigs, whirly gigs. It was quite a sight to see that just flying across the field, swarms of these. But no longer were they tilling the ground. It just screw in. So that only happened because the farmers at that time realized they needed to become systems thinkers. They needed to learn how to 
use advanced financial analysis tools. They needed to learn statistical analysis. They needed to be scientific problem solvers. Those were the things that allowed for a lot of these changes to happen. Also, the farmers in that, in 2050 now, they need to have four basic key competencies to be able to make a lot of the right decisions. Chemistry is so critical. Biology, soil, and plant sciences are the key core competencies to a farm today in 2050. These farmers have learned that a data plus a question equals information. And they've learned that they need to be asking the right questions of the data they're collecting. In the autonomous farm today, in 2050, we have enormous amounts of data coming in from all places of the farm. That data plus a question is really the blueprint of the coding that they use to tell the autonomous systems what to do. So thank you for taking a little journey with me into the future of the good, bad, and the ugly of future of farming.